And the next talk is from Tom Entwistle from the University of Sheffield, who's going to be talking about the evolution of nickel-rich cathode synthesis for lithium-ion batteries. Uh, so staying in the lithium-ion batteries frame, um, and this is a review of high future high throughput research out of you, Tom. Uh, good morning. Is this all working fine? Uh, yeah, that's working correctly. Cool. Um, good morning. I'm Tom Entwistle. Um, I'm I'm part of Serena Core's group here in Sheffield and part of Co-op 5 of the CDT. Uh, my talk this morning will be on the evolution of nickel-rich cathode synthesis for lithium-ion batteries, a review for future high-throughput research, which is the basis of my PhD. Um, so moving on to the first slide, I'll just give you a quick introduction to lithium-ion batteries. I know Jethro, amongst a few others, have covered how this works, but I'll just refresh your memories after last night's social. Um, so here you can see the typical layout for a lithium ion battery, specifically lithium cobalt oxide. Um, and we have the layered oxide cathode material here, um, followed by the graphite anode system. And during charging, the lithium ions and the, and the corresponding electrons dissociate, um, move across this porous separator to the anode with the electrons um, go into the electric circuit and during dis discharge, the um, similar redox reaction occurs and the electrons go through doing work through whichever electrical equipment is in the circuit, such as a light bulb, back to the cathode. Um, the, my presentation will be focusing on the cathode side of things and the synthesis of this lithium cobalt oxide cathode. Um, so just to run you through the history um, of the lithium ion batteries, um, the aforementioned lithium cobalt oxide um, family of batteries was first developed by John Goodenough and his co-workers in Oxford in the 1980s. Um, this part, that's, he is part of a team that in 2019 won the Nobel Chemistry Prize with um, Professor Whittingham, who first... Um, uh, just sort of conceived, conceived the concept of lithium ions and the, and the use of batteries and Yoshino, who um, developed the graphite anode. Um, this lithium cobalt oxide technology was then commercialized by Samsung and a few other companies in the 1990s, but it had some flaws with respect to the economic side of things, with it being more ex more expensive metal, um, having some environmental issues in, this, in how it was mined and some ethical issues surrounding that, particularly with the use of um, child labor in um, countries like the Congo. And it also had some performance problems with it only achieving approximately 150 um, of its theorized 270 milliamp hours per gram in, with regards to its capacity. So um, since then, some research has focused on nickel-based cathodes which is cheaper, um, it's more readily available and is being um, um, mined in places like Indonesia um, for the Chinese um, battery surge. And as a result, um, recent research is, but, um, sorry, as a result of this, recent research is focused on nickel rich cathodes. The problem with this though, is that um, lithium nickel oxides um, is relatively low state, uh, has a relatively low stability and can only be cycled a few times before its high theoretical and high practical capacity fades. Um, so to combat this, there's, um, we use doping with manganese and cobalt to form nickel manganese cobalt cathodes. There are other, um, other materials out there such as nickel cobalt aluminium cathodes, but this, for the sake of this presentation, we're gonna focus on NMC cathodes. Um, these originally started with more stable compounds with high cobalt and manganese to ensure um, a stable long life battery in the form of NMC111. But in order to meet the um, high demands of the electric vehicles, which has been quoted to need 300 mile range in order to meet the commercial boundaries and the con commercial acceptances, um, the um, specific capacity um, of these materials need to be increased. And as such, the nickel content, which is where the majority of these cathodes get their capacity, needs to be increased. One such material, NMC811, 
has been identified as a key um, material by many um, commercial industries and commercial companies such as Tesla um, to synthesize these and these, these can reach capacities in, um, close to 180, which is slightly off the 200 milliamp power per gram um, target, but um, these can be pushed to a high voltage and with a bit more research, um, there is hope that these can be used in electric vehicles for the future. Um, so the synthesis of these nickel-rich um, NMC cathodes are quite tricky because of the reactivity of the nickel ions, um, especially when exposed to air and uh, in the oxide state in the, in the product, which you can see on the right-hand side here. Um, these can form side products and in, um, parasitic um, materials on the surface of these and uh, of these crystal materials and can form performance degradation, performance loss. So to overview the synthesis uh, procedure, we start off with the nickel, manganese and cobalt transition metal sulfates. We then have, uh, add these to a reactor with a chelating agent such as ammonia and a precipitating agent such as um, sodium hydroxide. And this basic um, solution reacts to form a hydroxide precursor. It can also form other types of um, precursors, but primarily um, in literature, they focus on hydroxide precursors because of the um, lithium source. This lithium source um, is added by mechanical grinding um, to the precursor, um, typically using either pestle and mortar or similar sort of um, physical mechanism, um, before furnacing or calcining to form the oxide product, which um, you can see here in its nice layered structure um, with few impurities and few um, dislocations and crystal uh, in, uh, imperfections to perform a nice high capacity product. So we start off with the precursor synthesis. Um, as I've mentioned, these sulfates are added to an ammonia and sodium hydroxide um, in a reactor in what's known as a precipitation reaction. Now this is, uh, there are other types of reactions, but this reaction um, in particular is focused on and sort of um, promoted by many industries um, around the world and um, from the literature and other industrial sources that I've read, this seems to be um, the, the priority um, and the most likely way in order to mass manufacture these nickel-rich cathodes, um, certainly from a precursor point of view. Um, the difficulty is that the transition metals can be unstable, um, especially during this precursor stage. The nickel and the manganese are very prone to oxidation um, from the two plus state, which is where they are in the sulfate reactants, and they can oxidize three plus states to form spinels and other types of crystal structure, which causes disruption to the crystallinity. So if you remember the layered structure before, I'll move on to the next slide in a second to remind you, but they can form sort of cubes and, dis and disruptions to this layered structure which further reduces the capacity. Manganese um, is one such that is particularly uh, vulnerable to this oxidation. Um, and as you can see, the, it so this is a Porve diagram which displays the pH and the redox state um, of the manganese system. And it requires a low potential um, in these high basic pH ranges that you would find in an ammonia um, sodium hydroxide solution. It's all too easy for it to oxidize to, from a, a nice layered hydroxide state to a spinel state and um, higher than that. Um, so moving on to the precursor, um, precursor themselves, the hydroxides that I've mentioned, um, you've got these nice layered um, structures here. Um, the beta poly, the two polymorphs for this. Um, the beta polymorph is the preferred one in academia and in the literature um, because it's very uniform. There's nothing in between the layers. There's no irregularities. It's, it's been proven to have a high performance. Whereas there's um, another variation, there's alpha polymorph and there's an associated layer double hydroxide um, polymorph 
of this precursor. Um, and what this means is that there's these little blue dots, which are, in this case, um, water molecules that have integrated in between the um, hydroxide precursor layers. Um, but this can, uh, if there are cations and it, um, or even the water molecules, it, it has an unknown effect so far. It's be, it's um, it's not desired because it does cause dislocations and, and lowers the crystallinity of the structure um, by causing these impurities and these um, uh, yeah uh, impurities within the crystal structure, but. Um, it's unknown exactly what this has an effect after the calcination process because um, at high temperatures it would be expected the water would evaporate off. But so this is still under research, so um, I won't comment any further. Um, within the reactor vessel for the um, precursor, it's um, there are three main factors that sort of affect the particle morphology and the density, which affects the overall performance of the cathode material when it comes to its, its life as a cell or as a battery. There's the pH, the transition metal to ammonia ratio, and the reaction time. Now the pH um, affects the precipitation rate of the um, material. And it can, if it's too high, then the particles can sort of precipitate and the, um, precipitate too quickly and form smaller irregular particles and if it's too low then there's excess particles that can be uh, excess ions that can be left in the solution and um, similarly the transition metal to ammonia ratio affects the chelation which is the accumulation of the um, ions and as a result um, sorry um, as a result it can um, also affect the um, particle for particle morphology and size in a similar respect. The reaction time is relatively straightforward in, um, with regards to um, the relationship. The longer it is, the, lo um, the more spherical, the more mature the particles are and the denser they are. Um, with, so the second part of this um, reaction process is the lithiation and calcination stage, stages. The lithiation, as mentioned before, is mechanical grinding of the lithium source. So if you, would have, if you were to have a hydroxide precursor, you would have a lithium hydroxide lithium source, and this would be ground for a certain amount of time in a pestle mortar or a bore mill or some other similar mechanical grinding um, situation. This is then put in a calcination furnace um, in an oxidative atmosphere to maintain this nickel three plus um state which is the desired state for um, nickel rich cells and um, at a temperature that is high enough to achieve and maintain this layer structure and um, that you saw in previous slides without being too high in order to cause oxygen and lithium loss from the material and form a um, rock salt phase which is as um, sort of like a checkerboard phase where it's difficult for the lithium ions to move in and out and reduces the electrochemical performance. Similarly, the calcination duration also needs to be sufficiently long enough to allow the material and the particles to mature and densify. Um, yeah. Um, so for NMC811, this desired material, um, we've um, talked about the transition metal ratio and the to ammonia ratio, which should be one to one in order to max, uh, which has been found to be one to one um, with the optimum um, size, and as a, and I have a pH of ten point five to eleven point five. Um, this has been sort of accumulated through a few papers, but they all seem to produce similar particles that um, look like this right hand figure here. During the calcination process. Um, you need the temperature to be sufficiently high enough to um, form this layered structure without forming the rock salt. And this has been found to be approximately 780 to 800. There can be some deviation from this, but um, as I've mentioned, this can cause impurities in the, within the phases of these um, resultant material. Um, and if these were to be followed, then 
theoretically, you should be able to get a high capacity material with a high density of about two two point five grams per centimeters cubed, um, with a particle size of ten micrometers. There are other um, factors that impact that, but with regards to time and the scope of this presentation, I'll leave it up there. Um, moving on to things that can help prolong the life of these nickel-rich materials, because I've met, as I've mentioned, this time. Cool, thank you. Um, the lithium nickel oxides, the um, pure nickel cathodes, ca has a low um, cycle life and um, lifetime when cycled. Um, so as a result, um, some sort of uh, barriers need to be put in. So dopants is one strategy with which we've discussed with manganese and cobalt, but coatings is another. And there are three types of coating. There's rough coating, um, which would be sort of in process, sort of wet, um, uh, have like a wet solution and coat the material with that before drying. Um, and forming this coating through typical chemical processes. There's core shell, which I will discuss a bit later, and the ultra-thin uh, film coating, which is using methods such as atomic layer deposition or chemical vapor deposition, uh, atomic layer deposition or chemical vapor de deposition, which is a very specific and um, costly um, procedure, but it, this small, thin layer does improve the performance. Um, these do have um, benefits in terms of the performance and cycle life, as you can see on the right hand side. This uh, nano, the unnamed nano structured stabilizer um, can be seen to improve the capacity over 150 cycles by um, a significant amount. And, um, but the problem with these is that it adds a lot to the processing costs of it and the manufacturing costs. Um, finally, I'll just mention the spatial conditioning, which is the sort of core shell structure um, coating that I've mentioned earlier. These can be in the core shell structure or by the gradient particles, where as the particle goes from the center to its surface, the um, nickel content changes um, to a lower content at the surface, which provides stability of the surface while maximizing the, um, the capacity of the material. Again, this has some synthesis problems in terms of um, it's difficult to mass produce these and produce different and to tailor these um, particles over the time, uh, over the duration of the reaction, but it does prolong the battery life as you can be seen. Uh, as can be seen in the right hand figure, where this red line indicates a capacity retention of 86.5% over 300 cycles compared to 64.8% for the central NMC811 material. Uh, to conclude, um, with these reactive nickel rich materials, there needs to be careful control over the synthesis process and um, ensure that the particles and the reaction are carefully controlled in order to maximize the performance uh, and so novel strategies um, are needed in order to stabilize these nickel rich cathodes in order for them to be commercially applicable to uh, electric vehicles and other um, nickel rich uh, and other lithium ion battery applications. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Professor Serena Korb, supervisor and her group, uh, special um, shout out to Enrique Sanchez Perez and Dr. Marco Amores, who have helped me with this presentation and some work this year. Uh, also, thanks to the CET and the University of Sheffield for funding. Well Thank done, you. Tom. That's a really nice presentation, really comprehensive review. Um, we're still running a bit behind schedule, but we've probably got time for one or two very quick questions if anyone wants to put them in the chat. Um, but in the meantime, I've got one of my own which is maybe a bit more left field, but it was a, I saw a benchmark minerals report recently, which is looking at the cost breakdown of an NMC811 lithium ion cell. And about 50% of the cost is the cathode. This is including all the total cost of this. And then 50% of that is actually the nickel, which surprised me because I was expecting it more to be the cobalt or maybe the lithium. 
Um, so these nickel compounds actually contribute quite highly to the cost of these, these cells. And I wondered if you had a feel on the supply chain and yeah, working out that in the future. Um, yeah, so I think I, is that the battery um, week that they did just before Christmas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I also um, attended that, and there was some quite interesting insights there from um, different side of the supply chain. Um, I think that the nickel supply and demand will change, and I think that's maybe where um, why the cost of nickel is so high. Um, I think for the short term, at least for lithium ion batteries, I think that nickel rich um, materials are the way to go. Um, but as was highlighted in that week, that there might be other materials such as manganese spinels um, or other materials in the long term that might provide um, more of a, a competitive um, materials um, to this complicated and political recharged um, sort of environment. Yeah, yeah. No, really cool. Thank you very much for that presentation. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on and I'll encourage any of the participants uh, to use the chat and maybe Tom, if you stick around and can answer any of those. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, no, really good talk. Um, so next up we have from memory, I think it's Ben Rowden from the University of Southampton. Yep. So looking at estimating lithium ion battery behavior from half cell data. Um, so yeah, I'll pass over to you, Ben. Thank you, James. Uh, just stop this. Is that all good? Uh, yep, yeah, working correctly. Cool. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, yeah, I'm Ben Rowden from the University of Southampton, also part of the CDT and energy storage and applications. I'm supervised by uh, Nuri Garcia Arias, and um, I'm going to be looking at different uh, cell configurations and testing methods of uh, lithium ion batteries and then how we can use the data from those to estimate the lithium ion battery behavior from half cell data looking at the full cell data and then also a, a three cell electrode uh, three electrode cell to uh, look at the different data we can obtain from those so as we will all must all be aware by now with the amount of, it's come up this, this uh, conference the uh, government has obviously brought forward the move to electric vehicles uh, with the ban on fossil fuel vehicles from 2030 and hybrids then from 2035. And we're already seeing that move to EVs with over a million sold within Europe in 2020 between January and November, even despite the decline in uh, vehicle sales as a whole within the year. And then if we look at this um, survey from Deloitte in 2018 regarding battery electric vehicles, quite evident to see there's three major hurdles to further adoption with these in terms of the public. So we've got the driving range, uh, the cost, and then the lack of infrastructure. Obviously two of those can be directly impacted by the uh, battery that we're using here in terms of. So further development of these batteries are obviously gonna be helped to allay some of the worries that we see, especially regarding the, uh, the EV range that we buy increasing energy density of these batteries. Um, so if we look here at a going plot, we obviously see generally, most of the EVs will be operating on a lithium ion battery in this scale. We would be looking at trying to improve those targets to get higher energy densities in the form of uh, solid state batteries or lithium air or the lithium metal um, battery types such as lithium sulfur. But as Alan Patterson highlighted yesterday, I suppose with his, uh, with British Vault, that development time can take quite a while. And it's also highlighted by the fact that the first prototype we've seen for these lithium ion batteries in 1985 with the first commercial in 1991, but there's still much more development we can do even 30 years later. So let's just have a quick look at the uh, components that we have for these uh, lithium ion batteries. So as um, Tom's just discussed with this, we've got these cathode materials in this case here, this is an NMC811 structure. This key component we'll have here indicated by the separator, we have the electrolyte, generally a, a lithium salt in a, a non-aqueous solvent with some additives to help with passivating layer formation and help limit degradation within the cells. And then on the right here, we've got a layered graphite anode. And the two things I want to point out are these uh, specific capacity numbers that we have here at the bottom. So these are obviously theoretical values. So this is for graphite, 
already see that we have a higher value here for the anode than we do the cathode. But then we, when we actually take that to application, look at what we can actually achieve with these materials. As uh, Tom just highlighted, even with these NMC811, which we're expecting high capacities here of 275, we actually get closer to just under 200 milliamp hours per gram. Whereas with the graphite, we can achieve much closer to these, uh, to the theoretical values that I've shown a bit. So it's fairly evident that we need further research within this uh, area towards the cathodes, as so that's obviously the constraining factor at the moment to uh, improving these energy densities of these batteries, at least electrochemically. So uh, to help increase the range or not increasing the weight too much of these um, battery systems within the EVs. So now if we move on to looking at experimental setups that I've used just to analyse these electrode materials. I've done all of these in swage lock cells uh, rather than coin cells in this, in this uh, instance, just because of the added adaptability that we can use for different measurement techniques, which aren't also mentioned here, such as doing things like um, online electrochemical mass spectrometry and linking it with uh, different pressure measurements and other gas measurement systems. So if we take a look at the first two here we've got on the top, these are what we uh, term as half cells. So they are a lithium metal uh, counter and reference electrode versus an intercalating electrode, be that either graphite on the left or lithium ion phosphate on the right. So they're termed half cells because ideally the lithium metal electrode will have a far greater capacity than that of the intercalating electrode which results in its potential being fairly, it should be assumed to be stable throughout. And uh, yeah. uh, so the any potential measurement that we run with these should ideally just provide the potential response from the intercalating electrode. And then if we go further and make that into a, a little full cell that we obviously see, make it more um, applicable to what we'd see in commercial cells, we obviously just substitute the uh, lithium foil in both cases for the other intercalating electrode. So on the left, we have the uh, graphite anode. On the right, we have the lithium ion phosphate electrode. But obviously, as we don't have this large capacity source that we have with the lithium metal, this needs to be balanced. So to, and as the uh, anode operates very close to the lithium plating potential, when it becomes fully lithiated, the anode is generally oversized. And in these experiments, it's done by uh, to 10% oversize in comparison with the, uh, the cathode material. So let's just have a quick look at what results we get from these. Uh, this, this is the graphite lithium half cell response. Um, this cell was cycled by galvanostatic cycling between the potential limits of 5 millivolts and 1.5 volts at a C rate of C over 10, which uh, relates to uh, charge time, let's say of 10 hours and a discharge time of 10 hours is what we expect to see. Uh, for graphite, we, in the first cycle, we see this kink in the potential here and a large over potential, a large over capacity here, which goes past the theoretical capacity that we expect to see, but that could be attributed to the formation of a passivating layer in the case of an, a solid electrolyte interface for the graphite electrode. And as you can see by the capacity values in the table below, it, it, it contributes to an irreversible capacity loss of around 55 milliamp hours per gram from the charge and the discharge cycle. But when we go to look at the actual what I'm saying, discharge cycle in this case, um, the capacity values for the first two cycles are very repeatable. We see they differ by one milliamp hour per gram across the two. And uh, this, this was repeated across four cells and we saw the uh, largest deviation was in the, uh, the charge capacity of the first cycle, as you'd expect to see with the complexity of the SEI formation within these cells. And that equated to just under 10 milliamp hours per gram of carbon. Moving on to the LFP uh, half cell, this was often cycled at a higher uh, potential range due to being the cathode, so it's between 2.7, 4.2 volts, again at a C rate of C over 10. We see the expected flat plateau of the, uh, of the potential profile as you get from, as there's only one intercalation potential for these um, LFP materials. And we do get a reasonable gap, I suppose, which 
decreases from the first to the second cycle between the charge and discharge capacities, showing there's possibly a bit of internal resistance within the cell. Um, but when we look at the four cycled cells that would run for this one, we saw a maximum standard deviation between any capacity values of one milliamp hour per gram, which we can kind of attribute to the uh, the, the fact that we don't have a passivating layer to the extent, extent that we formed in the uh, graphite electrode because we're not operating close to the lithium plating potential and we're operating within the stability window of the electrolyte, which is not the case of the uh, graphite electrode potential. So what can we use this data to, to try and learn and what can we get uh, in terms of full cell data from this? So if we to try and calculate full cell data from this is fairly simple. We first have to identify the limiting electrode that we have for each uh, cycle step, then have to map those potentials to a common axis. So obviously in both cases, in terms of capacity, we've normalized by the mass of the, uh, the given mass of the material rather than doing it by a charge pass. So we can either map that to charge passed or normalized uh, multiply by a factor to normalize by one of the two masses. Uh, we then need to interpolate so we can get, so we can manipulate this data a bit easier. So we have them at the same capacity values or the same intervals. And then it should just be a simple subtraction of the graphite potential for the LFP potential to give us a cell voltage between the two electrodes. So if we just break down those steps and see what we've got, um, in terms of the limiting electrode, it's going to be the electrode which is being delithiated. So obviously as we start with a lithiated iron phosphate uh, within the cell, that will be our limiting electrode. Then as we the graphite will be lithiated during charge, it will then be delithiated during discharge, will be a limiting electrode and that will repeat throughout. We then look at the capacity values. First capacity value will be equivalent to that of the LFP potential. We've also, in this case, we've multiplied by 2.17 to map it to the graphite capacity scale. So we've taken into account the different specific capacities of the two materials and the mass balancing that's occurred. And obviously in the first cycles, we haven't had any uh, irreversible capacity losses yet. We don't need to take into account any adjustments. So that should be a fairly simple calculation for the first step. Uh, first step. Then when we come to the second step, we do need to take into account those capacity losses. So we've obviously had the SEI formation due to operating outside the uh, electrolyte stability window. And that equates to a shift in the potential by 94 milliamp hours per gram in this case from our data. And then that repeats within the next cell in the next step. So we need to take into account when we're doing the LFP potential, we need to change that by 21 milliamp hours per gram to account for the SEI formation and then map it by the scale of 2.17 again. And then that's the same with the additional, uh, there's additional uh, capacity, irreversible capacity loss that we see in the first and second cycle, just the 3 milliamp hours per gram in this case. Let's just have a look at a few of these steps and how they impact our data. So the interpolation doesn't appear to make any difference. So that means we aren't going to see any uh, influence essentially from changing from the experimental data to slightly manipulated interpolated data. And then on the right here, you can see this is the modification we've had to make for the graphite potential to take into account the SEI formation. And you can see instead of being fully equated down to naught point uh, down to five millivolts, we're getting close. We start at a potential closer to uh, 100 millivolts, which obviously greatly changes what we expect to see within the uh, cell voltage. Um, so let's first start by looking at some experimental data of these full cells. Uh, the capacity value of the first charge cycle is what we, is what we expect. It's, equivalent to that of the LFP uh, capacity value that we obtained in the half cell, which is just over around the mid 150s uh, in terms of capacity. Again, we see the SEI formation that we expect to see due to the graphite. We see it here with the lower potential here in the initial capacity values. And then obviously with the irreversible capacity loss between the first and the second cycle. Um, the slight difference we see between from the half cells is we don't get this, this uh, highly repeatable capacity value from the discharge potentials. We do see a slight loss and further irreversible capacity loss that we see within the graphite electrode. And uh, across multiple cells run here, 
the uh, standard deviation was actually lower than that of the graphite itself. So now actually comparing what we've uh, calculated with the experimental data, um, as you can see from the graph on the left, the capacity values gave a decent prediction with the maximum um, variation between those values being for the second charge cycle, uh, which was about 3% variation between the two. But the thing that can be noticed, I suppose, from this first left, uh, from the graph on the left, is the difference in potential values that we do see. And then to further understand that, there's a graph on the right here. This is the differential capacity analysis of this, of these, of this data. So that takes in a differential capacity with respect to the uh, cell voltage in this case. So it should give us the uh, cell voltages at where the uh, intercalation events are ha happening. In both cases, we get three sharp peaks with fairly similar areas, as we've seen because of the comparable capacity values. But with the calculated value, it's uh, shifted to a higher cell voltage. That's oh, just... Five minutes, man. Okay, thank you. We're generally attributed that to the uh, increased resistance we see as a f as we're using two cells to calculate one uh, cell potential uh, cell voltage. Plus, we did see a large uh, difference in the discharging a charge potentials in the LFP cell. Um, so this is, I'm just going to discuss one further method. And, which can kind of bring together both of these uh, cell configurations to try and get the best out of uh, just one cell configuration. So analogous to the two electrode cell, we've just got, this would just be the full cell configuration here on top. And, it's, and then in addition, we have a third electrode system in the form of the T cell. So we have a third which, electrode which will act as a reference. In this case, it's a partially lithiated LFP electrode, um, because as we saw with the LFP potential, it's very flat. So if we're halfway across that potential, any perturbation should cause a, shouldn't really cause any change in potential of the reference electrode, because we want the reference electrode to be chemically stable and unpolarizable. So lithium could potentially be used as, again as a reference electrode as it would in half cells. Obviously, we want to try and limit the uh, chemical reactions which are occurring and as that's operating outside the stability window of the electrolyte, uh, we don't want to try and avoid those um, reactions. So in this cell, we can monitor both the both electrode potentials like we can in half if we run the individual half cells, whilst also monitoring the cell voltage. And this is what we see as a result. So at the top here, this is the potential versus time graph, we've got the uh, the cell voltage, which shows a similar, similar trend to what we saw for the, the uh, two electrode cell. And then in the middle here, we've got the LFP potential, which the potential range you kind of expect to see because we'd expect it to be fluctuating around zero with our uh, reference being a uh, partially lithiated LFP electrode. And like with, with the assumption we made in the um, calculation, we don't see this LFP electrode being fully lithiated upon discharge of the cell. And we don't see the, cath the uh, graphite electrode down here uh, reaching as low a uh, potential as you might expect, as we'd expect to get around to close to minus 3.5 uh, volts versus this LFP reference. And one slight trend you can just make out with this cell as well is obviously seeing some unwanted reactions possibly with the a potential drift at this um, Referential electrode, which is unexpected, we see a slight trend upwards on both of these uh, potential values. But that obviously highlights where we could see issues within the um, electrode potentials, which we don't see anything within the cell voltage. So it does show that there's potentially merit to the, uh, running a three electrode cell where you can get in extra information. And then, so just to wrap that up, that we've shown with the calculations of the in this. In the case of an LFP graphite cell, half cell data can generally be used to uh, match a full cell data, which I suppose indicates in a way that there's li limited slash close to no um, cross uh, across electrode, I suppose, reactions within this uh, system. And as we, yeah, the capacity values end up being fairly close within 3% of each other, the largest deviation. But and the, the, uh, we did see the slight shift in the uh, voltage potentials 
which we attributed to the low internal resistance that we see within the full cell in comparison to the addition of the two power cells. But then further techniques such as three electro cells can then be can bring the combination of these two cells to monitor both electro potentials and cell voltages, but there's further complexity and work needs to be done on those to try and optimize those. Yeah, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Great stuff, Ben. Some really good uh, fundamental research there. I really like it. Obviously, I'm not a chemist, so I'm a bit out of my depth. I'm still going to barge in and talk about batteries anyway. Um, I guess the, the first question is, wh where do you think this technique could be used next? Do you, do you see this as like, um, are you happy with the results of the half cell approximation? Um, the half cell, yeah. That's, yeah. that's fairly uh, close to what we Obviously, it would be good to see if we can do it with other, other uh, cathode materials, because obviously we're not going to be changing the... Uh, anode material, but that's, I suppose the anode material leads to the most complexity with the SCI formation. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I suppose the cathode material, and then you can see whether you are seeing these, this electro cross talk mm. between uh, the two electrodes, which you might see for other electro types, because obviously LFPs are fairly st stable electrodes. So if we did something with uh, an NMC electro, where you might have some further degradation products, mm. you could, uh, Give you some extra information. Mm, for sure. Cool. Okay. Um, I think I might move on to the next talk because we're um, a few, few yeah, minutes okay. behind schedule. I'll check but yeah, I'd, I'd, in the I'd encourage everyone to type in the chat if you've got any questions for Ben. Yeah. And I'm sure he'd be yeah. very happy to answer them. Yeah. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. Take care. Uh, and then last but not least before the break, we're moving over to supercapacitors. And we have a physicist, Nicholas Hillier from the University of Southampton talking. Uh, with his culinary inspired electrolytes for benign textile supercapacitors. Brilliant. Cheers for that. So let's just see if I can. Can everyone see my screen as it is? We can. Brilliant. So hang on, let's get this going. So um, yes, I'll be discussing wearable energy storage in today's talk, um, not to scare you off but we will not be discussing lithium at any point in this discussion and we will not be actually discussing any reactions so um over the last uh few speakers um we've seen fundamental work yesterday we saw heat storage we saw or grid scale microgrids um we even saw atomic scale work so i fit kind of in the middle of that because i'm looking to place energy storage into your clothes. So my talk will all basically sit around the why, especially as I'm trying to speak to you today about edible electrolytes, I think you deserve to know the why. Um, I'll then walk you through how I explored these ideas and then the results, and then I'll wrap it all up. I'm gonna hopefully whiz through this because I'd rather speak to you than speak to my screen and me. So, uh, Wearables. Ultimately, the bigger area that I'm in is wearables. So I work in a group that has led the way on end use and mostly energy harvesting. So at the moment, we can do some quite amazing things. We can integrate um, energy harvesting, whether it be piezoelectric, triboelectric, ferroelectric, even RF energy harvesting to then all power these uh, um, end use items as, as I have on the screen. We've got um, electro stimulation uh, for muscle um, health. We've got humidity uh, sensors, PCBs. And there's this whole spectrum of work. And if you like this idea, I'd strongly urge you to have a look at um, the link in the bottom right. But very, in very much like how we have it at the grid, we've got energy harvesting and we have end use. And this um, end use is needed in medical, defense, consumer, it's internet of things even. Um, it's quite a, a large area, but they need power and energy harvesting can only harvest when the trigger is being used. So much like the wind isn't always or blowing, you're not always or moving. There's not always RF around you. So to bridge the gap of the or power issues between when you harvest 
the power and when you use it you need energy storage and that's where i arrive and that's the reason i've been all uh allowed to appear in this all group and and in and um or interlope in so the immediate next thing to ask is why do we not have wearable energy storage everywhere at the moment and that's because it's hard not to not to highlight I have all the answers, but wearable energy storage has extra hurdles you don't normally have. You, you are, oh, the batteries or the or caps are being put into some pretty harsh areas. And also it's gonna be near you. I don't want a lithium battery, particularly on my skin, if it's uh, within a shirt or within a hat. Um, I don't want um, electrolytes which are sketchy. So we have to think about that as well as the performance, which has predominantly been electrolyte lights. All of the work has been all based on activated carbon, moving into 2D materials and structured materials, and then moving into things like metal oxides and or P dot, as we heard about yesterday. So a lot of the work has kind of ignored the electrolyte. And I think it's wrong, actually. If you do a bit of a study on this, um, on Google Scholar or the like, you will see that predominantly the electrolytes are aqueous or PVA based, because you want it to not be fluidic because otherwise it'll wick away, which is bad. Um, but works are increasingly appearing that highlight that or PVA electrolytes and aqueous, so um, H3, or PO4, PVA, they don't age particularly well and, and, it, and they work awesomely in the immediate, uh, but then they stop working, they crystallize, they uh, dehydrate. So instead of going down the common idea of just using the electrolytes we already have, I thought, what would I want to wear near my skin? And what hasn't really been looked at. And I was inspired all, all by the work of Wang and Na, who are actually in the more uh, extreme end of this because they're looking to actually produce completely, uh, they want you to be able to eat the or device because it's going to be used to or power endoscopes and medical things. And so, they're that stage on, but I thought, why not have a look at um, edible electrolytes? Because if I can eat it, I don't mind it being on my skin. So to briefly explain to you the experiments, what I did is I took a number of fluids, which we'll see next, and then I used my standard wearable uh, work as a or basis so you have to sneak in a little SEM um, or image these are a centimeter um, wide so you basically you make these by just starting with your your uh, fabric it can be cotton silk whatever you then uh, create your carbon ink mine is a nine to one ratio ink with um, the active element uh, being a highly or porous carbon. I then use EVA as the binder. You then simply load the ink and you spray it on. It's as easy as that really. What is quite unique in my work is we don't stack it as layers. You'll have sprayed on, on this edge, and you also have it sprayed on the opposite edge, and actually the whole or device is held within one layer, which is cool. But um, you then stick it in the electrolyte, and then you uh, uh, put all of, of that in a vacuum. We've discovered that if you don't have this extra stage, a lot of air is held within the inter uh, layers within the weave, you need to remove that to get the wetting up. So um, this is how they look and all of them are made in this way. And then we'll discuss the electrolytes. So 
after raiding my fridge and my drawers, I thought of four edible ele um, electrolytes. Uh, we've got various strengths of a salt solution, which you can buy commercially, uh, an energy or drink, um, and a, a generic sports or drink. Um, all of these had elements in which have been shown elsewhere or just rationally would work. I mean, um, an NACL mix should work. And to then reference all of this against a real world thing, um, I've also uh, made a half mole a uh, solution, um, which I've used in other work, as has my group. But these are all fluidic, and I said earlier you need to use or PVA often as an agent to stop the wicking. So um, I took the or best or device fluid, um, and then I added these agents in which were briefly discussed in abstract yesterday by Sylvia. Um, these are seaweed or based agents. Um, hers was from brown, mine is from red seaweed, but these are widely used in high-end food uh, works. Again, it's all edible. There is nothing in these electrolytes you won't like. They're aqueous, they're just made in water. So. We've got the, the why, I've explained to you what I'm bringing in, and now we'll have a look at the results. So, first off, all of them worked, which is surprising, I may highlight, but I want to draw your eye to A, B, and E. C and D are very, um, rugby ball-ish. Um, they are highly resistive and that's highlighted over here on the right as well. But A, B and E, E being the actual electrolyte, the ADP, um, is squarish, which is what you want. We don't uh, want any extra reactions. We want this to be purely electrostatic. But actually A and B, from these results alone, do appear to arguably be a better electrolyte, which is initially surprising and slightly worrying for my work that a thing that I stole out of my drawers might be actually or better than what I had made. But this is encouraging uh, to have a look at how square they are and they're not that resistive as a, um, ironically. So these results are more to show the idea and to show if they work, the real results are here. So did they work? Can they store anything? Um, again, I want to highlight C and D uh, being the energy or drink and the sports or drink are not great. There you get a very, distinct curve and it's not that all good. To be fair, they are a lot more, they have a lot more extra bits in them. And I don't know how that interacted. Also, you'd expect them to be weaker um, with their uh, ions and the active species within it because Whereas A, B and E, I could control it with C and D, I just had to use what was there. So it's not that off, but they do produce workable energy storage or devices. What I would like to show you again is this salt, which I just all pulled out of my or drawers, does work reasonably well. And at, actually at the lowest um, measurement, actually outperformed the um, normal uh, or device. But then it did 
um, or degrade um, a bit more. But we can see that actually for A and E, we're around the 20, 25 or milli F. That is all we need. I'm not looking for megawatts. <laughs> I'm looking for milli, micro, watt hours. This is really quite surreal. Um, and we were not expecting it to be as good as this. So we've looked at the fluid. We took the best one, but we have to make it non-fluidic, otherwise uh, it will wick. Um, the agar agar, frankly, didn't work. If you have a look at this red line, um, it wasn't great. But the other seaweed did work. Obviously, if you look at or B, it is more resistive. It is not as good. There will be more loss. But you expect that even in the higher end um, work, the minute you move from a purely fluidic, uh, you will begin restricting the ions. You will begin to add in resistances. So this is quite cool. And whereas before the peak um, result was 25 or milli F, we've now got in the green line, we've Five got 22. Nick. Brilliant. We've got 22. Um, so actually, we've only got a slight loss in overall performance. So to just wrap it all up, this was a bit more lighthearted as a piece of work, uh, but is but has a place because as a group of uh, research, we get quite hung up on we want the graphene, we want the nano onions, we want this and that and the other, and we'd ignored electrolytes. So actually, for me to just be able to go into my fridge or pick out a fluid and make it work highlights that we don't have to go always towards the extreme. We can just have to think a bit more. And as these results highlight, these aren't bad results. This is an activated, carbon or device. This is equivalent to the average banding you would see in um, work. Um, the work I based my stuff on went beyond me. They used cheese, they used barbecue sauce, they also added in extra dopants, um, which if I were to expand this work um, I would also look at. But I would merely end this or talk by just highlighting that we as a community always seek the most advanced solution and there's or times we just need to be a bit more adventurous in what we look at. So I would like to thank my immediate um, research area. I'd like to thank Steve and Sheng. I'd also like to thank Andy Pruden and EPSERC and my wider group. So I will end there. If anyone has any questions, I'd love to have a chat. Awesome stuff, Nick. I think everyone really enjoyed that. Um, we do have one actually from Nicole, which is, uh, it says, brilliant and simple and love repurposing things that are around us. Are you aiming for an Ig Nobel with your edible energy storage? Um, I will take any award I can get. Um, no, in all honesty, I know this, it was a bit lighthearted, uh, but if you look at the work of Wang and Na, you can get some really important results in the right application. So obviously, mm. I wouldn't expect any of you to use this because you don't expect to have to wear it or eat it but actually um, their work in particular they expect it to go into humans and then not leave the human um, so there is some merit in this and I'd particularly uh, highlight one of the or papers I can't remember which one has the best um, extra I've ever seen and they actually eat 
their um, <laughs> work halfway through. So they do a measurement, they eat a bit of it, and then they stick it on again. Um, that is self-belief. It, it is an incredible <laughs> addition, and I was amazed you could uh, do it with cheese. But um, <laughs> it, it's really awesome work, and it has a place. I would not argue it's everywhere, <laughs> but there is a time and a place for this work, I think. Cool. Awesome stuff. From the University of Southampton. So thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah, as he said, my name's Ewan Fraser, and I'm just coming to the end of my time with the CDT at the University of Southampton. Um, and today I'm going to present to you a two-dimensional numerical model of the membrane-divided soluble lead flow battery, uh, supervised by Richard Wills and Andy Cruden. And I've also been working quite closely with Dinesh on this project as well. So just quickly what I'm going to run through today, uh, hopefully most of you know what a Revox flow battery is, but I'll introduce it anyway and then uh, tell you about some of the differences between a conventional Redox flow battery and a soluble lead flow battery uh, before moving on to some of the differences we've again included in the divided soluble lead flow battery. So in this piece of work we start off with just a simple one dimensional model, um, so I'm going to take you through how we set that up and then present the results from it in terms of electrolyte conductivity and the potential drop across the membrane. Uh, and then using the results from that 1D model, I put that into a 2D model, which I'd already developed in some previous work. And then I'll present to you the concentration distribution and the potential across that, and uh, hopefully explain how I've managed to set up this divided uh, soluble lead flow battery model. Uh, and then we'll bring some conclusions together. So redox flow batteries, uh, if you're not, uh, not familiar with them, um, this is kind of a typical schematic of a redox flow battery. They're secondary or rechargeable batteries, uh, tend to be at the megawatt kind of scale or above. Um, I've said high energy there, perhaps compared to some of the technologies like compressed air we heard yesterday. Uh, it's not very high energy, but we're talking kind of four hours and above of storage. Uh, it tends to be stationary applications, although there has been some talk recently about trying to put them in, in various, uh, various non-stationary applications. Um, and one of the big advantages of redox flow batteries is that energy and power is decoupled. So energy tends to be stored solely in the, in the electrolytes. So if you need more energy, you either have a more concentrated or a larger volume of electrolyte. And power is determined by either the size of the cell or the electrodes within the cell or the number of cells within a stack. And they're typically a two tank membrane divided configuration. So here's just a one cell uh, stack as an example. So we've got a negative electrolyte, a positive electrolyte, and they're both separated within a cell uh, by a, an ion exchange membrane. So a typical soluble lead flow battery uh, looks a bit like this. So immediately you see it's quite different. There's only one electrolyte and uh, it can operate without a membrane. Um, the reason it's able to do that is both reactions have this PB2 plus and uh, the active species plate out onto the electrodes during charging. So you get solid, uh, solid lead at the negative electrode and solid lead dioxide at the positive, which means you've already got a physical separation of the active species, so there's no uh, immediate need for a membrane. One of the other big advantages is there's an existing lead supply chain. So potentially uh, this battery could fit into that supply chain and use recycled lead from other sources such as uh, lead acid automotive uh, batteries and uh, it tends to use methane sulfonic acid rather than something like sulfuric acid. Uh, so methane sulfonic acid is known as a green acid, certainly greener than sulfuric acid. The divided soluble lead flow battery. Um, so kind of going back on myself a bit here, um, it doesn't have to operate in an undivided manner. So there's kind of three configurations you can have for it. The first one is the undivided, so single electrolyte, no membrane, as I just presented on the last slide. Uh, the next one in the middle there is what we call semi-divided, so still just a single electrolyte, uh, but this time there's a porous separator within the middle, which just physically uh, separates either side. So if you start to get dendritic growth across, there's a physical barrier in the way to prevent shorting. Uh, and then the final one is you can actually use an ion exchange membrane and separate it so it looks a, a lot more like a conventional uh, redox flow battery, uh, where you have a negative and a positive electrolyte. Uh, the, the main advantage of that one is that you can then use electrode specific additives. So if you've got an additive that you add to the electrolyte, which is um, beneficial at one electrode, but detrimental at the other, uh, it means you can add this uh, ion exchange membrane, which, which keeps it only in one half cell. So moving on to the model, um, how do we model this battery? Um, so to start with, we just had a one dimensional model. So pretty simple domain there. 
where you've got uh, an electrolyte, an ion exchange membrane, and then the electrolyte again. Um, and to model the conductivity within the electrolyte, we just had a single electrolyte domain, but again, just 1D model. So modeling that conductivity using the inert Planck equation. I'm not going to go through it in too much detail there, uh, but that models the, the mass transport of the ions within the electrolyte. And the only real difference between the transport and the electrolyte and the ion exchange membrane is the ion exchange membrane is a porous medium, um, which means you have to have this effective diffusion coefficient. So this uh, di term here uh, is your diffusion coefficient. And because of the porosity and tortuosity of the membrane, we need to turn it into this di effective. Um, so epsilon here is just uh, the porosity and times it by one point uh, to the power of 1.5 is what we call the Brueggemann correlation, uh, which is, is effectively accounting for the tortuosity within it. So again, that fits into the Nertz Planck equation and you've got the effective diffusion coefficient and also the defective ion mobility here, which also incorporates the diffusion coefficient. So both those terms are now effective terms in the porous domain. So boundary conditions, uh, it was pretty simple. We just applied a small potential across the whole domain. So we 0.1 volts at one end and just ground at the other one. And we had fixed concentrations of the H plus, the PB2 plus and the methane sulfonate uh, counter ion there. The other boundary condition, I'm gonna explain that again in a bit more detail in the next couple of slides, uh, but is what we call the Donnan potentials. Um, essentially at the interface between the electrolytes and the membrane, you have a big jump in potential. Uh, it's, it's near vertical, so the easiest way to model it without having a really, really fine mesh near those, those uh, near the membrane boundary is to use this Donnan potential equation, uh, which I'll explain a little bit in more detail here. So within an ion exchange membrane, uh, you have a fixed charge distribution. Um, so for example, in an ion, an ion exchange membrane, you'd have, uh, so one that allows negative ions to cross it, you'd have this positive charge distribution within the membrane that's fixed in place. And simply from an electron neutrality point of view, if you've got a fixed charge uh, concentration within there, uh, if, you, if it's positive, you then need the equivalent negative charge in there as well. So on this graph on the right hand side here, uh, what we've got here is just a negative ion and a positive ion uh, matched against these domains at the top here. So within the electrolyte domains, uh, because there's only two ions of an equivalent charge, they're both of equal concentration locally. And then once we reach the ion exchange membrane, because you've got this additional fixed charge, you have a big increase in negative ion concentration and a big drop in positive ion concentration. And again, the opposite at the next membrane. So what happens if we actually plot the electrochemical potential? Um, there isn't much of a big change here. It changes gradient slightly, but there's no big jump. So there's, there's no sharp gradients in that graph there. Um, so the equation for the electrochemical potential is here, which means that either side of that vertical line on the previous graph, we can assume that the difference is so small that if you're really, really close together on the order of nanometers, uh, we can assume that the electrochemical potential is equal approaching from within the membrane and approaching from outside the membrane. So then if you rearrange the electrochemical potential equation to get it in terms of potential here, uh, and then minus one from the other, where one and two are simply just either side of that membrane boundary, uh, then you get the equation for the Donnan potential here. And then you'll get a graph that looks something like this for the electrolyte potential. So you get this big jump uh, within the membrane, or oh, sorry, at the membrane boundaries. So onto some results. So the electrolyte conductivity here, uh, if you look at the graph on the top right labeled A there, that's kind of the, the previous, um, what everybody who's modeled the soluble lead flow battery has previously used to model the concentrate, the conductivity versus the concentration within the electrolyte. It's nice and simple. It just uses the nernst einstein equation to get the mobility, which is uh, that first bullet point there. And you get a linear relationship between lead and the free acid concentration. If you look at the black solid line in the graph B there, you can see that that's really not the case. And in fact, at high acid concentrations, so once you get above kind of half a molar, you actually start to decrease in concentration and conductivity as you increase the lead concentration. So clearly that's not quite good enough if we're gonna be modeling something that relies on the conductivity. 
So what I've done is I've included uh, a much more complex relationship between uh, the concentration and the ionic mobility here, uh, mobility here, um, which is validated against that experimental data. Um, there's a much more complicated relationship. Uh, I'll, I'll take you briefly through the equations. Um, but essentially, it's the Nernst-Einstein equation with this correction value gamma here. Um, to work out that correction value for gamma, we need several other uh, parameters as well, which are what the rest of the equations are working out. Um, it's semi-empirical. So this log to the base 10 of gamma i uh, is what's known as the debye fuqua equation, a slightly modified version. Um, and then I've used some empirical values to fill in some of these parameters here. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, but essentially it gives us a much, much closer uh, version of the actual conductivity um, than the previously used simple Nernst-Einstein equation. So then using that uh, in the membrane model. So again, this is just from the one dimensional model and validated from that same piece of work. Um, we've get, we get this reasonably close match here where we've got our squared values of 0.97 and 0.98. Uh, for my experimental uh, data versus the, sorry, the experimental data versus my simulated data. Uh, there's two simulated techniques used here. Um, one of them essentially simulates the experimental technique. So because it's virtually impossible to measure it directly across the membrane experimentally, what they did was they measured it uh, two millimeters away either side and then subtracted what the expected um, conductivity of just the electrolyte would be. So that would leave you with the uh, membrane uh, potential drop. And this is PB utilization. So this is essentially a state of charge for the soluble lead flow battery um, going from a zero utilization. Um, so where you don't, the, the, it's fully charged, uh, sorry, fully discharged up to 100%. And you can see we get this reasonably close value. And in fact, the two simulated techniques are reasonably close together. The only difference is due to some concentration gradients within the membrane. Uh, sorry, within the electrolyte, um, which means that the uh, conductivity is slightly different. And again, here we've just got the potential, uh, electrolyte potential versus distance here. So you can see here that the Dunham potentials are actually pretty small. There is a small vertical line at those corners, but actually the majority of it is due to the uh, conductivity of the membrane itself. So we can now use those results in a two-dimensional model. Um, this is based on some work that I've done previously and is previously published. Uh, it'll be in the references at the end, so I'm not going to spend too much time on the development of that model. It's quite complex. Um, but some of the main equations, again, uh, uses the uh, Nernst-Planck equation for the conductivity, but the additional um, terms, because we've now got electrolyte flow in there in that second dimension, so we need some Navier-Stokes equations. And I've also introduced the electrode reactions at the boundaries at the electrode boundaries. Um, and again, the boundary conditions, uh, we've got a variable applied current, so it's a constant current, um, but I've used a few different currents, no slip walls for the electrolyte flow, and a constant velocity at the inlet and atmospheric pressure at the outlet, and then butler ball mechanics. Um, any more detail will be in the associated paper and uh, in the previous paper that we've published, which is reference number two there. So the concentration, um, so this kind of shows that uh, as you get during charge, as you get the lead plated out of the electrolyte, um, you can see that it's a change in concentration pretty close to the electrodes, which is what you'd expect. But you also get this big jump within the membrane due to that fixed charge concentration. Um, so yeah, there's that big jump there and that's associated with the Dunham potentials, um, which we can see on the next slide. Oh, sorry, that's during discharge. Um, so yeah, sorry, the Donner potentials, if you can see just near the boundary there, that increase, that concentration rises um, and falls on the other side so that you get, uh, you will get some Donner potential difference there. And that's mainly due to the H plus concentration. So then the potential here, um, again, distributed across the cell. We've just taken a cut line across the middle here, um, and this gives the electrolyte potential. Um, so you can see that there are some jumps there, so there's Dunham potential, but there's not much difference between them, um, which is the point I'm trying to make here. So because uh, 
you'll get a jump and then an almost equivalent jump at the other side. Uh, the overall potential drop across the membrane should be quite small from that. And uh, that's what this table here presents. So we've got the Donham potential uh, in volts and um, the potential drop due to the conductivity within the membrane and the ratio here. So these are all pretty high, um, showing that here the conductivity is 84 times higher than the Donham potential. And you've got a similar story during discharge. Um, so actually, five minutes left, you. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Um, so drawing some conclusions from that, um, we've managed to successfully simulate the operation of the soluble lead flow battery for the first time, or the divided soluble lead flow battery, sorry, that should say. Um, and we managed to predict the conductivity mobility and then the um, conductivity distribution and concentration distribution using a novel technique to the SL to the soluble lead flow battery. Um, so we've got a significant improvement in the conductivity uh, versus the previous linear approximation and over the operating range of the soluble lead flow battery, uh, concentration gradients across the membrane are low enough so the ohmic loss within the membrane still dominates the potential drop across the membrane. Um, so the, really this has just been a development of a tool which hopefully we can use to predict future performance of membranes and determine some of the required properties and we could potentially also include some electrode specific additives in future to check the crossover and things within that membrane. Um, so yeah, those, those are the references I've used. Uh, the second one there is the paper, which will give you some more information on the two-dimensional setup. Um, but thanks for your time and any questions, please. Thanks for you and um, really great to see how this works uh, resolved. Um, do we have any questions from anyone? It's okay, brilliant. We have a question from Dermot. Uh, what sort of additives uh, would you use and why? Um, so the main ones are, I, I guess, leveling agents. So um, as I mentioned right at the start, you can get dendritic growth uh, across the membrane. So if you start to get dendrites, particularly at the lead side, they can actually grow all the way across the membrane and uh, so all the way across the electrolyte domain. Um, and if there's a membrane there, if they're strong enough, they could puncture it. Uh, and if there isn't, they'll just continue to grow and short out the cell. Um, so you can get things like leveling agents in there, uh, I guess the main one. Um, there's several different um, additives you could use. Um, Ligna sulfonate and bismuth are the ones I use, um, but the, there are a long list of others that could potentially be used. Fantastic. And we've got, so um, the question uh, remaining for, uh, we have one from James. Um, what do you think is uh, the biggest ob obstacle to the commercialization of this type of battery? Um. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> to be honest, scale up. Um, uh, the, most of the work on this battery has been done at kind of single cell, 100 square centimeter um, size. Once you get to slightly bigger, uh, bigger cell areas, um, things like the electrolyte distribution across those and therefore the current distribution across the electrode starts to become important um, and becomes much more difficult to to maintain an even flow over it. Um, I guess the other thing is there still needs to be a lot of work at the positive electrode. Um, I think uh, there's still not 100% sure what's going on there. There's a couple of side reactions um, that occur at that positive electrode, um, but it's close. I think I think it could be scaled up relatively soon. Uh, fantastic. And uh, so uh, we, uh, very similar uh, question that links into that from Nicole, just before we move on. Um, what are the potential applications of these batteries and what needs to improve for this to be possible? Um, so potential applications, as I say, it's a, it's a redux flow battery. They tend to work better at reasonably large applications. Um, I think actually because of its ability to be linked in with the recyclability, it can, it can be really low cost. Um, so anywhere where there is an abundant supply of, for example, spent lead acid batteries, I think this could work really well. Um, so there may be some niche applications for this specific battery over other redox flow batteries, such as the vanadium flow battery, which is starting to dominate at grid scale. So perhaps slightly lower than that and potentially more remote locations where you could have um, direct recycling um, from lead acid batteries into the soluble lead flow battery. Um, might be quite a good niche application. But then obviously we need to work on the, the recycling directly into it, uh, which happens to be the project I'm working on next. Absolutely. And so uh, to 
it's a, it's a bit of context there, you and I, um, I guess you're referring to, for example, like the, um, the African battery market there, for example. Yeah, yeah, perfect, yeah. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, if we, um, that's, that's the questions. So thank you very much, Ewan, for, for that. As I said, great to see how this works there resolved. Um, and now to finally, before lunch, if we introduce uh, Joe Smith. Hi, uh, okay, one sec. Uh, figure this out. Uh, okay, can you see that? Yes. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Um, okay, so. Right, so yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Joe Smith, uh, second year PhD, uh, and my presentation is on uh, developing a microscale CO2 reduction reaction cell for mitigation of carbon emissions. Um, and I will add, obviously, just because of like uh, COVID and everything, it's meant that my time in sort of in the lab has been fairly limited. So I haven't done as much uh, sort of experimental work as we'd like so far. Um, so a lot of this is more of a sort of overview um, of like literature, uh, but as well as obviously what I've done so far. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah. So what we're going to talk through is starting off with uh, sort of general aims, um, objectives, and sort of motivation behind it uh, project. And then there's uh, three reductions: uh, reducing CO two emissions, the uh, reduction reaction of CO two, and reducing the size of the carbon dioxide reduction reaction cell. And then lastly, the sort of conclusions I've reached um, and what I intend to do sort of moving forward. And so, yeah, the overall sort of aim of the project is, like I said before, uh, to develop, design and test a new type of electrochemical cell that's more efficient, um, sort of performs better than current uh, carbon dioxide reduction reaction cells, which uh, will have sort of greater poten uh, commercial potential. Um, and how we do this along the way is uh, to research the obviously the CO, current CO2 R cells where they are in development and their sort of limitations, carry out experiments on the electrochemical reduction of CO2. So for example, uh, cyclic voltammetry or um, linear polarization as well as gas chromatography uh, on products. Uh, investigate the uh, sort of micro electrochemical uh, cells and MEMS technology, and then I want to design, model some uh, micro CO2 reduction cells and build and test them, then analyze the performance sort of in terms of how they, uh, how efficiently it sort of uh, convert CO2 into the reaction products. Uh, and, obviously, and the benefits and uh, yeah, motivations behind the project are obviously to improve the performance of the cell, um, which leads to CO reduction in CO2 emissions. Um, while also reducing the need for carbon intense uh, chemical manufacturing processes. Um, and then, yeah, to develop cells to have a wide range of applications. So, uh, yeah, reducing CO2 emissions. Why is it necessary? Well, as you know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas which causes global temperatures to rise, affecting the climate and sort of causing extreme weather conditions all around the world. Uh, and currently, uh, atmospheric CO2 levels are rising. Um, and between uh, 2003 and 2012, it, 12, it was uh, recorded that the rate of CO2 levels increased uh, by an average of uh, 3.78 milligrams per meter cube per year, uh, ending up at 708, uh, 708 meter, uh, milligrams per meter cube uh, in 2012, which obviously sort of all adds up, uh, ends up being quite a lot, uh, sort of significant increase. And uh, as you can see in the graph uh, here, uh, sort of CO2 emissions, um, they sort of increased uh, rate of CO2 emissions starting around uh, the Industrial Revolution. And obviously, although some of it uh, is a natural process, a lot of it's caused by human behavior. So this needs to be uh, corrected and reduced. So what can we do about it? Firstly and simply, we uh, cut down on the processes which release CO2 into the atmosphere. Secondly is carbon capture. Uh, carbon capture is made up of four areas. 
carbon, uh, the carbon dioxide capture itself, uh, storage, separation, and utilization. But, uh, generally, removing CO2 directly from the atmosphere uh, has proven to not be particularly cost effective and it's quite technologically challenging. Uh, so, efficient CO2 capture can be divided into uh, pre combustion, post combustion, and oxy fuel combustion carbon capture. Um, and the focus of this project is on post combustion. And this is where the uh, CO2 from exhaust gases um, emitted by combustion are absorbed. Uh, and then the CO2 is then still going to be used to turn into other chemicals, uh, such as in the CO2 reduction cell. So, yeah, it's next session is on, on that uh, reduction reaction and the cell. So, uh, essentially, it's a uh, electrochemical, it's an electrochemical reactor which converts CO2 into other chemicals via uh, a catalyst and, and power input. Uh, and it has pretty much the same design to a uh, polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell. And you see sort of uh, an image as uh, MEA in the middle, uh, in electric catalyst on either side, um, and then the flow field plates outside of those. Um, all together. And yeah, so the general idea of the cell is that the CO2 is absorbed uh, from flue gas produced during peak energy demand, and then uh, the absorbed CO2 undergoes a reaction using renewable energy when demand is low, producing the chemicals you want. Uh, so in terms of the chemistry of the system and the reaction involved, the carbon dioxide can, uh, can either be delivered as a gas or bubbled through a solvent. Uh, and the most common one is potassium bicarbonate solution. Uh, but there are other possibilities, such as uh, potassium hydroxide and sodium bicarbonate, also used to dissolve CO2. Um, there's also different membranes uh, that can be used depending on sort of which products you want and what, how you want the reaction to go. So that's either a proton or an anion uh, exchange membrane. Uh, how the catalyst itself is applied to the electrode can also affect the cell performance. So that's uh, as a sort of solid metal catalyst or as a powder or nanoparticles, which are sort of they're better. Uh, and, and then depending on which catalyst material you use, you get different products. So um, copper favors ethylene, platinum favors methanol and tin formate uh, among many other uh, possible uh, materials. And uh, this is obviously ben extra beneficial because these chemicals are usually produced uh, by quite carbon intensive processes. Uh, but yeah, so personally in, uh, in my project, I'll be using a copper catalyst because this has already been used by uh, in a lot of projects at the university. So I'm sticking with that. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the literature uh, I've, I've found looks at flue gas and power plants as the source of CO2. Um, but a lot of them sort of don't consider sort of realistic conditions um, and sort of limitations, one of which is the flue gas has quite a low concentration of CO2. Um, it's around 15%. Um, so the ones I did found, uh, papers I did uh, find that spoke about this sort of um, talked about using a high pressure system to deliver the CO2 um, for effective uh, transport of it. And uh, as well as this, um, alternative sort of hydrogen sources have been looked at, um, in particular sodium borohydride, because it's uh, solid and it's easier to store. And um, yeah, there's also been some research into using the um, CO2RR cell for power generation. So either as a reversible cell using the energy to convert CO2 into chemicals um, to produce electricity and then vice versa, uh, or uh, using CO2 in reaction to produce electricity itself, um, which is science quite, quite noteworthy. And uh, I intend to sort of look into all that a bit further. Uh, so yeah, on to developing and optimizing the cell design to be a microcell. 
so yeah, MEMS stands for Microelectromechanical Systems and describes devices or components on the milli to micro scale. Um, so you can see it's a micro fuel cell that's of a sort of one centimeter square kind of size. Um, and yeah, these uh, also sort of describes the fabrication techniques uh, such as lithography, etching or micro machining, uh, those sort of main, main ones. And yeah, so some of the advantages of MEMS devices in general includes uh, improved batch production. Uh, obviously they're smaller, which is better for a lot of applications. Uh, lower, they have lower energy consumption and they're relatively easy to integrate into existing systems and they're more precise as well. Um, which is obviously quite useful in a lot of its applications such as sensors, uh, optical devices, uh, microfluidics, and as I sort of mentioned before, the micro power sources such as microfuel cells. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, while I was uh, sort of researching a lot of it, I found a, a lot more work on microfuel cells compared to microelectrolyzers or uh, carbon dioxide reduction reaction cells. Um, I was fortunately because they're quite similar, a lot of comparisons can be made between them. So I was able to do that with a lot of my research, um, or at least hopefully sort of something I'm looking into. Um, because yeah, so my, my fuel cells have been developed for around 20 years and they've shown a lot of promise as a potential alternative to batteries, as low, they've got low mass and volume, which means wider range of applications, such as uh, phones or laptops, and uh, even the space industry. Um, and yeah, one of the big advantages of micro uh, of a micro cell compared to a conventional one is that the smaller flow field means an increase in the surface area to volume ratio, um, which means there's there'll be more contact between the reactant and the active area of the cell as it goes through the flow field. Um, which I'll talk about now. So yeah, the promise of different types of flow fields in fuel cells are quite. Uh, widely researched. Um, there are a lot of different types. Uh, serpentine, parallel pin, spiral, all quite common designs, um, but generally serpentine tends to be the, the best uh, form of all of those. Um, so there's an example that I, I made myself uh, in figure five. Um, uh, they, they tend to have in fuel cells anyway they have, tend to have the higher uh highest power output uh all the signs that people test uh and here's just a few more examples um i found in literature so there's another uh serpentine there's uh parallel the pin or the spiral so there's yeah you see there's lots of different types basically um but yeah so Regarding the sort of geometry and topology of the flow field, the uh, channel and rib dimensions, uh, which are which are shown there, uh, as well as the effective length, uh, they all sort of affect cell performance. And um, so, sort of the longer effective length improves improves it, uh, as the smaller channel to rib width ratio, um, which again I think it's sort of to do with the uh, improved surface surface area to volume ratio. Um, but yeah, so obviously in a the optimal sort of dimensions and shape could be different in a micro system due to um, microfluidics working differently. Um, and so that's sort of the main thing I want to investigate. Um, so yeah, the next steps let's do more. CO2 reductions, uh, to test other reactants with electrochemical analysis and gas chromatography. I have done some already, but I haven't been able to get the data yet um, onto here. Uh, but also, yeah, so uh, I want to further develop the flow field designs in addition to what I've already done, probably uh, using like CAD software like SolidWorks. But yeah, primarily focusing on the serpentine structures uh, with sort of high pressure capabilities and then to model the uh, fluid dynamics. And ideally, I'd like to compare designs at both a micro and macro scale. Uh, but this will probably be a quite time dependent thing. Uh, then after that, I can hopefully get them built and then test them uh, in a similar way to the initial uh, experiments. And then 
lastly, if possible, I want to investigate the feasibility um, of developing the cell so it can also work as a reversible cell and capable of producing power itself. So yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Joe. That was um, exactly 15 minutes. Uh, great time there. A very interesting uh, talk about um, the work you've been able to do so far. Uh, do we have any questions from anyone at all about this? We do indeed. Right. Fantastic. Uh, from Nick Hillier, uh, what are the main production challenges when you take a more traditional fuel cell um, down to the MEM scale and which manufacturing process do you think you will use in your future work? Um, I'm Wait, sorry, say again. So what are the main production challenges? So the, the manufacturing challenges, yeah. um, if you take the traditional fuel cells and then uh, try to produce those um, as MEMS. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think at the moment, it, a lot of the MEMS um, sort of fabrication processes are a bit more expensive. Uh, so more expensive to do, but uh, there's also, there's sort of non-MEMS technically uh, ways of doing it. Um, so that will, there's, there are other methods as well, but um, I think even with sort of 3D printing and stuff that that's got potential to be used. Okay. No, fantastic. And, and which, which process do you think you'll actually use to manufacture them in, you, in your future work? Um, I'm not actually sure yet. No, fair enough. Yeah. No, absolutely. Fair enough. And uh, a question from James, just to round up. Um, what type of optimization uh, do you want to do to improve the serpentine design? So, yeah, I found like quite a few different versions, like with sort of double channels or like multi channels of a serpentine design. So I was going to um, sort of try a few myself, maybe sort of look look into it more mathematically, um, trying to figure out what what might sort of be the best. Um, but yeah, so I was, I was mainly just gonna, um, when I sort of model them, um, try and optimize it that way as I go along. Um, uh, thank you for that, Joe. Um, uh, really interesting stuff and it'd be great to see what you're doing, uh, what you're up to in the future.